Hello, welcome to Curiously Polar. Uh, before we start, here's a quick announcement. We have just untangled something. Um, you, If you've been a subscriber to Curiously Polar here on YouTube before, this is uh, especially about the YouTube channel, then you uh, might have noticed that this run under my channel with a lot of different other content. We have finally untangled this and have our own YouTube channel now. So you can subscribe. And if you're subscribed, you can get only the YouTube channel. Uh, channel with the Curiously Polar content and nothing else mixed in. So this is um, this is what you what you what you have to do. You have to do. Everyone and knows you don't have to. <laughs> Only if you like this content. Um, and if you have multiple accounts, uh, then just sign up with multiple accounts and subscribe yes. to each and every single one. The reason is okay. This is th there's a, there's a very very valid reason for this this is not vanity on our side it's not that oh we is our, uh, this is not an ego thing this is about getting the right channel name because youtube only will give you uh, give a new channel their own name as in youtube.com slash channel name if you have 100 subscribers or more <laughs> and uh, so we need uh, subscribers to be able to get rid of this un Sightly, U C X J F C V U, and so on. I mean, okay, that's it's, what they it's do. It's very, very easy to remember. Yeah, it's very. It's not that easy to remember, um, but um, we have a, made a shortcut to get to this channel. It's right here on the screen, and of course, uh, the YouTube algorithm also kind of needs a bit of tickling every now and then, especially with very new channels like this one. Even though there's a lot of existing content, this is now a new channel, so subscriptions are really helpful for that. They they signal YouTube that, hey, these guys are up and coming and uh, we need to give them a bit more visibility. And while you're at it, there's a thumbs up down there and the bell. And if you do all of these, then um, that will make us very happy and that will also make the YouTube algorithm very happy. Uh, with that out of, out of the way, <laughs> here is this week's scheduled episode. It is March the 1st, 2021, and this is Curiously Polar. Hello, welcome back. I'm Chris. This is Henry. Um, good morning. How are you? Good morning. I'm doing great. Oh, I'm it's not morning anymore. Well, that does, does depend on where you are and when you're exactly. listening to this. It's always a question of time zone. Ah, we're back with stuff, lots of stuff. We have, <laughs> we have, um, we have a whole bunch of news and interesting things from the polls, and then we are going to talk about our main topic, which today is hmm, dinosaurs. I haven't I talked about dinosaurs. They're, they're supposed to be still around in the Arctic, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Well, we'll find out if that's really true. Um, <laughs> but uh, let's go into our newsreel. We have a whole bunch of interesting things. Um, the first one, I think everyone who's on the social media and is in, in any shape interested in uh, in Arctic and Antarctic stuff will have seen the Iceberger, which I think came came through my timelines, I don't know, 10 times maybe from various sides it's been sent to me um and it is it is an iceberg simulator which i'm totally into i've, I've spent like 20 minutes on that thing drawing shapes so here's <laughs> it's, what it's you quite do. addictive yeah, yeah. You, you barely can stop so so it, it was inspired by a tweet by megan thompson who kind of drew she's a glaciologist a, in um yes. in the university of colorado in boulder and exactly, right. she just drew uh, an iceberg just to to um, visualize how icebergs would balance out because you have the um, the rule that only ten percent of the iceberg is visible, and you have this saying of the tip of the iceberg, yes. and that leads to the kind of the general assumption that you um, imagine the iceberg as kind of a cone shaped thing and. Um, it's only the tip you see, but if you would have a cone shape and you can just try to paint it in there. So, uh, so that's what, that's like. what I'll do here. Uh, again, video uh, watchers are at a, at a slight advantage right now because if we paint it like a triangular thing, so here it is, and then you let go, it, it makes the iceberg and then it kind of uh, does a bit of physics on it and, and rotates it in a way that 
it would probably exist in real in the real world i guess i think uh, only um, two-dimensional so only two-dimensional also, yes it's it's yes. an approximation and it's it's more of a toy but yeah you can you can i don't know i mean just just make any arbitrary shape and it will try to um to float in a way that an iceberg would at least with some assumptions i think they assume it's about 10 percent above the water which as we learned in some previous episodes it's not always true but um I don't know weird shapes, <laughs> and you get to you get to have a ton of fun here. Can I draw a second now? You just draw another one. Uh, but people get really creative. They write things in there, and um, I've seen a Titanic iceberg. Um, awesome! It's it's really really creative, and it's it's really interesting <laughs> to see how they how they distribute um, their their weight in in weird ways and. Um, um, and some, some will really tumble and turn around. And that's what you see in the real world, that an iceberg uh, is not always stable. As, as ice melts on the bottom, it will change its, its weight and the, and the center of gravity will shift. And then at one point, uh, the, 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 the whole, whole iceberg rolling. comes rolling around. And yeah, then that, exactly. that's, that's why it's dangerous to be too close to icebergs, because you <laughs> kind of really can't tell... What it's going to do? So yeah, let, let me let me stop painting icebergs. <laughs> <laughs> Way too much fun here. Um, so we'll put the link in the show notes so you get to draw icebergs and uh, enjoy this as well. Um, second thing is we have a major uh, carving event. Uh, event. 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 Which um, is happening? Where is it happening? It's on Brunt Ice Shelf. So that's the Weddell Sea. And we talked about the Brunt Ice Shelf in previous episodes um, in connection with the Halley Research Station of the British Antarctic Survey. And you possibly remember that the British Antarctic Survey decided to remove or to, to move the Halley Research Station um, from their old position further up on the ice shelf because of the cracks. And we talked quite a lot about the, the cracks. We had on the ice shelf um, two existing cracks and a third one formed and a fourth one. And this fourth one actually is the one that's on that map here in the north, the so-called North Rift. So the red, um, the red one we're seeing here. Exactly, it's the Red Rift. And in the beginning of, uh, of this year in January, it increased its um, yeah its spreading. It moved forward with one kilometer per day. So it extended further one kilometer per day. That's at an incredible speed. And then on the twenty wow. sixth uh, of February, um, this whole rift just um, yeah finished and released an iceberg. So it is this now in the wild, so to speak. It is not connected is. to Antarctica anymore. No. It's not connected to the uh, ice shelf uh, ice shelf anymore. Okay. It's the transition zone um, between the um, Brunt ice shelf and the Stanko, um ice shelf. So um, we have yeah interesting dynamics going on there. It's not only coming from one glacier, uh, glacier but from from two. And we have on um, NASA Worldview a beautiful satellite picture where you can actually see very clearly in the upper part of the uh, of the of the frame um, the, the black rift that releases the iceberg and if you just jump on one day further then you can see how that grows of course it's not like the iceberg immediately sails away there's a lot of um of, of things going on there you have ocean currents um going on quite a lot this is just actually the the smaller part so this iceberg roughly the size of uh, greater london area and it's the smaller part of what we expected um, to to happen. So there's more coming up, and um, I'm, I'm still mm. sure you, you remember there was the part of the Brontë shelf which is only connected to a two-kilometer long stretch between um, Chasm One and the McDonnell yes. um, um, the McDonnell Ice Rumples. So that's going to be uh, interesting there to to follow on. The crack itself, roughly 20 kilometers from the Halley Research Station. So that's actually quite yeah. interesting. Also, um, the research station is not manned at the moment um, because exactly of, of, of that. It was expected uh, to happen since about like 10 years. Um, particularly not in that part, though. 
So that's kind of a surprise here, but not obviously to people who are um, researching and following that area very closely because that North Rift just extended very, very quickly in the beginning of this year. So what's the what's the size of this iceberg? It's, it's now called an iceberg, right? So it's now called an iceberg, yeah. It's uh, the size of Greater London area, 1,250 square kilometers, if I'm not mistaken. So it's quite something. Wow, okay. So there's another <laughs> that's another one to watch by on a week <laughs> week by week um, newsreel uh, thing. Okay, next item on the newsreel is um, uh, something that we predicted a while ago, and it is now coming to fruition because uh, and it's not necessarily a good thing, I think, that the yeah. the northern route is now uh, becoming viable as a shipping route because of less ice. And uh, here at, in the Barnes Observer, there's a Russian video, a Russian icebreaker has now uh, opened up this route pretty much in midwinter. That's the point in midwinter, right? So we, we have to, to clarify here, it's not the icebreaker that's important. It's the icebreaking LNG tanker in the background of that particular right. um, picture. And we have here a video that accompanies that uh, ship. It's a it's a rather famous ship, actually. It's called Christophe de Mar uh, Marjorie, named after a former um, oil manager, I uh, see. French oil manager. And that ship traveled from the Yomal Peninsula to China and back. And that in in the middle of February, in, in, in winter time, so that's really something incredibly um, outstanding. Because usually during that time of the year, the sea ice should be so thick that both the icebreaker and the tanker should have some severe trouble to go through. And eventually that had just like two spots where the ship actually needed to reverse. I think um, yeah, it needed to reverse a couple of miles and, and um, drive backwards astern. But apart from that... Um, the reports say that the, the vessel um, managed to maintain an average speed of 40 knots, Which even is though this. decent up there, yeah. It is really decent if you consider a uh, sea ice of um, like one, one and a half, two meters thick. That's just something very, very incredible. So the tanker has LNG, which is, uh, is it liquid gas. I think it's yes. liquid gas uh, on it, so um, fuel. And, uh, and this sort of. I don't know. Can we can we consider this to being kind of the opening salvo in a whole barrage of uh, commercial shipping activity up there? That's something. Uh, when we talk about commercial shipping, you always have to consider you still need an ice strength and hull there. So it is not just like regular okay, tankers not, not going up there. Not any ship can go up there. Not okay. any ship, exactly. You, but to be fair, the Russian fleet is prepared for that, particularly uh, up in the north. The Northern Sea Route is um, kind of a strategic um, objective for the Russian government. But what's really frightening here is that we actually can see that um, certain areas of the Russian Arctic, for example, the Laptev Sea in um, Russia's high north, which is considered to be kind of the birthplace of Arctic sea ice that has not started freezing over um, until January. And that's the first time since records began. So that's that's very much delayed. So the ice the LNG tanker was going through couldn't actually build up as it should be. And by that it was much, much thinner. And we will uh, very likely see that more often, more frequent now. And um, that certainly makes the Northern Sea Route shippable for certain types of ship, possibly all year round now. Okay, next item on the newsreel is um, connected to Nornickel, which, if you remember, Again. is the company in, in <laughs> Russia that uh, created the biggest oil spill of all times up in the Arctic. And that has been um, fined 1.6 billion dollars or something, wasn't roughly it? roughly two no, two billion yeah. or ru roughly two billion dollars uh, fine um, because of that oil spill. And uh, they are in the news again with something else. And there was an accident. Very tragic. There. Yes, very very tragic. So Nornickel, after the oil spill, just announced that they. Um, 
invest a lot of money in the safety of the uh, whole infrastructure. And apparently that's not um, enough, that's not fa uh, fast enough. So three people actually recently died in a partial collapse of one of Nor Nickel's uh, processing plants up in uh, Norilsk. And what actually um, happened is that possibly due to violations of safety rules during the renovation work, um, some of the building structure uh, just collapsed and just buried um, the workers. And due to that, Nor Nickel uh, issued a press release and said that the head of the um, plant has been suspended from uh, his post. Hmm. Um, it's oh, oh, wait, the oil spill wasn't enough to get him suspended? Uh, instead, it took um, people dying? Uh, it's interesting. It is, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's... Let's leave it at that. Um, last bit on the newsreel. We have an amazingly big newsreel today. Um, last bit <laughs> on the newsreel is Turkey, of all places, is planning something new. Tell us a bit more about it. Yes, Turkey enters the 30-something uh, amount of nations to actually operate a research station in Antarctica. They're already operating a temporary research station. And now they want to use the location to actually build a permanent research station. They applied with the Antarctic uh, Treaty um, nations to actually build that research station in the next couple of years. It's uh, called Turkish Antarctic Research Station, TARS, very creative. And uh, it looks rather decent. It's um, along the um, Antarctic Peninsula on Horseshoe Island. Very, very interesting um, location. Very interesting also for uh, Turkey to actually highlight Antarctic research. It's pretty interesting because the uh, Antarctic or the Polar Research Institute in um, in Turkey is rather new, just founded in uh, 2017, if I'm not mistaken. So that's really brand, brand new. And Turkey tries to um, establish itself as uh, one key player in uh, Antarctica. Still, it has a lot to 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 learn, a lot to pick up, to to take up um, compared to other um, operators, to other research states, uh, nations down there. So that's a exciting new project. I'm I'm really curious what this will um, bring and how that will actually take shape. So the pictures here in the Polar Journal um, are by the Turkish Polar Institute, and those are renders. Those are not there yet. This is the thing that has been applied for, pretty much. So yeah, if you um, if you scroll down on that page, you will see a, a photograph of researchers in front of containers. Yes, and that is the temporary research station. So it's basically a, a bunch of containers um, taped to the ground. And Quite an they, upgrade they have planned there. It would be a certain upgrade, yeah. Yes. So it's um, it's planned as an all-year-round facility with uh, 25 scientists during the summer and uh, roughly 12 all-year-round stuff then for the winter operations. All right. Well, that was the... We need, we need, we need a news jingle or something now. <laughs> <laughs> dum, 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 dum. Um, let's go on to Antarctica and uh, especially the topic of today, dinosaurs. I'm it's happy to amazing. talk about dinosaurs because I love dinosaurs. Every boy loves dinosaurs and there's a little exactly. boy inside me. Yes. So what it's, is it about dinosaurs? It's the, the, the young boy's most favorite topic. And um, yes. I remember I when I was young, I collected a dinosaur magazine and that was just very recently released back then. And it came with like parts and you could just assemble a skeleton of your uh, favorite dinosaur. And I did just too. <laughs> <laughs> I had a, I had a, I had a glow in the dark skeleton of a dinosaur. <laughs> me too, me too. <laughs> I love that so much. And um, dinosaurs have known um, to to exist on pretty much all continents uh, on on Earth, with one exception, and that's Antarctica. And for quite some time, uh, Antarctica has been kind of a total black box in, in in that sense to scientists. And the big question remained there: where? have they been and why couldn't scientists find them well if you think a little bit about Antarctica you possibly get to the point very very quickly it's a very very difficult um, ground for scientists to research and it's um, very icy very empty very desolate very very cold 
doing research there is the one thing, but also picturing dinosaurs there is another. Can you imagine the dinosaurs left in Antarctica? Um, it's, well, not in today's Antarctica because it's really cold and dinosaurs. I the picture I have in mind with dinosaurs is uh, is Jurassic Park. It's a tropical island with palm trees and things, with warm climate where dinosaurs live. Um, but on the other hand, I would think that Antarctica wasn't always that cold, was it? No, exactly. That's the point. So um, there used to be a time when Antarctica was was covered in forests and um, dinosaurs supposedly roamed um, the, the, the continent. But how could the place that's today the icy um, remote wilderness we, we know once have been so warm and how could that ever support um, Earth's most gigantic creatures? And if we want to understand that, we have to go back in uh, in in time, and not only in time, in geological time. So, Antarctica was um, once ice-free during the uh, Cretaceous period, and Cretaceous period lasted from 145 to 66 million years ago. So that's quite some time, and that long ago might seem um, un unfamiliar, but we know um, something about that because it was the last age of the dinosaurs before presumably an asteroid hit the Earth and ended their time on this planet. And the, the video we just um, had on the on the screen, that gives us a little bit better idea of how a, the, the land masses might have looked back then. Things so, have moved around a bit on the surface of Earth. Earth. Exactly. So you can actually see that Antarctica was connected to what's Australia today and on, on the other end also what's uh, South America. And that just changed. But back in the days, um, around roughly 100 million years ago, that was all still connected. And um, we had actually, during that period, forests at both poles. So there are are fossils of trees and corporate reptiles that um, allowed um, scientists to build kind of a picture what the climate um, once looked like. And corporate reptiles need the warmth of the sun to survive. So they that's like the, the, the major feature. Today we see them basking in the sun to warm up dur during the day. If you just think about a lizard, for example, you will mainly see the lizard uh, sunbathing somewhere and that's just because he really needs the heat of the sun to heat him up um, at the poles where the sun disappears during the winter month it must have been warm enough for them to still survive throughout the darkness because we still had the tilt of the earth and we would like to have a little closer look to the uh, southern landmass with the second video we have provided for you. Um, I'm not sure we can show the video, but we have um, a, a still by, uh, of Pangaea, if that's what, you, what, what you're looking for. Does no, that help? That's, no, not really. Let me, let me try. It's always difficult to get the rights for videos, but we'll, this one is by Atlas Pro um, about Pangaea. That's the one we're looking who has, for, right? Who has, by the one, amazing videos. If you're a little bit a geology nerd, Atlas Pro on, on YouTube has really amazing videos um, visualizing and explaining stuff. Really, really great to just go there. Um, however, he, he just shows um, how we actually travel in geological time from one supercontinent to another supercontinent and how that actually um, supported life in the South because then um ocean dynamics ocean currents used to be different and uh we we know that um through the land bridges of what's australia today uh, between australia and uh, antarctica and also um the land bridge between south america and antarctica there was an exchange of um of, of biomass so there was not only um plants traveling but also animals in particular than um dinosaurs so let's hop a little bit um, forward in time to 1986 when a, a group of Argentine scientists made their way to James Ross Island. And they did under the uh, leadership of Eduardo B. Oliveira. And this is actually a very nice picture of James Ross Island. If you can see James Ross Island nestles a little bit along uh, Trinity Peninsula. Um, in the Weddell Sea, and more precise in the Erebus and Terror Gulf, named, um, by the way, after the two very famous ships, Franklin later got lost in um, in the Northwest Passage up north, 
However, James Ross Island is separated today from the Antarctic Peninsula by the Prince Gustav Channel. That's on the top and the left of um, James Ross Island. But that wasn't the case all the time. Back in 1986, when the expedition went there, there were used to be an ice shelf. And we have a satellite picture from 1988 that actually shows the ice shelf. And you can see on that picture how the ice shelf connected the Antarctic Peninsula with the Ross uh, Ross Island. And you can see how the streams from the Sjögren uh, glacier on the left side just merge in that ice shelf with um, glacial streams coming down from Haddington Ice Cap and Dobson Dome on James Ross Island on the right. But back to the expedition itself. So, Senor Rivero and, um, and his expedition went down to James Ross Island. And Olivero is the former director of the Centro Austral de Investigaciones uh, Científicas. And he is a, a geologist. He's working on stratigraphy and paleontology, on sedimentology. And he is possibly the expert on that northern tip of the Antarctic Peninsula and how that northern tip and the islands of the uh, James Ross Island group have developed during the so-called Cretaceous period. And we remember from that video, Cretaceous period defined as the period between 145 and roughly 66 uh, million years ago, ending with the extinction event of the dinosaurs. When the dinosaurs left Earth, that's the end of the Cretaceous period. So the Antarctic Peninsula, including James Ross Island, once was connected to South America throughout this time, uh, allowing the interchange of fauna between both continents. Eduardo Oliveira um, came with his expedition um, down to James Ross Island and they came back home in, in, in 86 with a very sensational finding. They excavated a few fossils. And when we talk about fossils, we mean small bone pieces, in this occasion, namely partial skeleton and bony plates of some sort of body armor. And according to the announcement back then, the preliminary analysis of the very few fossil they, they um, brought back to Argentine let the scientists um, identify the specimen as something new. It's something they couldn't find before. So they identified that as a new plant-eating species, and they named it later um, Antarctopelta oliveroi, after, um, of course, Mr. Olivero, the expedition leader. And of course, we also have um, an artist render down here. You can see some pictures in the video uh, where, we, where we see some artist renders of that um, dinosaur. You can see it's a medium-sized um, saurier. It's uh, called, or this classified as an ankh. Ankylosaurs, um, reaching roughly four meters in length. It's uh, 13 feet for our American friends. And it showed characteristics of two different uh, dinosaur families, making um, a more precise classification rather difficult. But because it's assumed that those dinosaurs couldn't uh, cross water, that they found a late entrance into uh, Antarctica uh, via South America. So that's like the the, the home definition of how they traveled from um, north to south. And the area around James Ross Island seems to be the dinosaur hotspot in Antarctica at the moment. Right after the Argentine expedition in 1986, an expedition of the British Antarctic Survey discovered the second dinosaur on Vigar Island, which is just next to it. It's a neighboring island. Just two years later, in 1988, an Amer uh, American expedition found um, remains of the now known um, hadrosaurs, also on Vega Island. And since it's the first duckbill dinosaur outside the Americas, scientists see the finding of hadrosaurs as a proof of the theory that the dinosaurs might have found a way from South America into what's today uh, today's Antarctica. Scientists have then later in 2008, found in Martha Cove remains of Trinisaura, of which we also um, might... No, we don't have a picture of, of Trinisaura today. But Martha Cove, also James Ross Island, 
So it, it seems to be very much uh, focused there. Um, another fossil found there is in, in Parabato Antarcticus, also a pretty amazing um, little dinosaur. There, there so, is, by the way, a Trini, Trinisaurus, um, this one from Wikimedia. Oh, yeah, great. And it looks fuzzy. I mean, this is the interesting thing. What um, what did the, the what the depictions when I grew up of dinosaurs usually sh sh showed them like reptiles, skinny, scaly, and so on. And I think what was later found out is that um, well, they are the ancestors of of the birds today mostly. So um, there were apparently quite a few dinosaurs back then that had feathers or something similar. And uh, someone recently said that, that most dinosaurs probably looked like really big chicken. So I found this, <laughs> I found this interesting. Very likely, yes. Because, and I mean, the, the problem is that that part of the dinosaur doesn't survive. It's the bones that survive, um, but usually not or almost never the skin or the, the, the features that you actually see. That's why it's so interesting that they found this body armor in the um, 86 yes. Uh, yes. expedition so that's that's really something very special so they can could say this dinosaur very likely wouldn't have had feathers but this body armor but with all the pictures um of dinosaurs you always have to keep in mind there are artist renders we don't have skin particles we don't have there was no photography there. back then no photography back then or if the photography existed <laughs> there it might have just died throughout the extinction event which we think might have been the asteroid. So we see dinosaur could live in Antarctica because it wasn't Antarctica as it is today. It was not only connected with what is today Australia and South America. It's also it also used to be much much warmer. So the high temperatures um, occurred during the middle of that uh, period. We know as the Cretaceous uh, period is also known to geologists as Cretaceous hothouse, a hot greenhouse effect that uh, caused by increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So we have had much, much warmer uh, climate back then. And that also led to the fact that we have obviously also a different flora in the area. What we know about the mid-Cretaceous in particular is that we had much faster rates of sea floor spreading and by that also more volcanic eruptions and that caused much, much more carbon dioxide in the air or in the climate than we can find today. So the places those fossils have been found so far are largely ice-free and rather easy accessible. And I would not underline easy accessible. Going to James Ross Island is everything but easy, but it's certainly easier than going to Vostok Station, for example. So it is uh, an ice-free patch. You don't have um, a glacier on there anymore. It's not um, constantly covered by, by sea ice. So some of those um, fossils have been found on land. Some have been washed away already. So it's at the edge there. And the more the Antarctic ice sheet will retreat, the more area the ice will set free, the more likely is that scientists may unveil more fossils to get a better picture of how Antarctica might have looked like in those previous periods and that in turn will give us hopefully then a better understanding of how things have changed in the past considering the hothouse climate that might be quite some some gain of knowledge for what to expect through the um yeah climate emergency situation um we are in at the moment and since everything somehow is interconnected that might be very very useful for us to extrapolate how the current changes will affect not only the sea level rise, but also the development of, of, of life in Antarctica. And I think that's a, a pretty awesome um, outlook, despite the tragic of the climate emergency. And also gives us a better understanding of how dinosaurs actually could have lived in a place so hostile as Antarctica is today. Wow. So, um, um, what what kind of places on Antarctica? You, we've just looked at the at the uh, pretty much um, the the, the James Gustav Ross Island, Ice Shell, James Ross Island. Um, are there any other places on Antarctica where 
Yeah, so we have looking basically for... we have basically two hotspots. One is um, the James Ross Island group, which includes also uh, Snow Hill Island, Seymour Island, uh, Vigor Island, and of course James Ross Island. The other hotspot is in the and, that, trans- and, and the James Ross Island is at the tip, um, almost well, <laughs> it's the closest to Argentina, pretty much. So um, almost yes, yes. It's on the it's on on the on the western side of the peninsula. So I it's see. um it's it's on the opposite side of um Argentina. So Argentina would be north of the peninsula here. Uh, so we have the peninsula yes. in the in, in the picture and um James Ross Island is south. But but, but again, what, what what you said is the reason we're finding things there is because it is that close and um there might be much, much more uh, evidence. It's not um, only that close; it's also ice free. It's accessible, yes. so we actually can yes. dig for for uh, fossils there. Um, the the other place where fossils have been found, and which is like the second hotspot, is in the Transantarctic Mountains, uh, namely in Mount Kirkpatrick. And there, particular American expeditions have um, discovered a number of fossils. It's so, quite a bit further south here. Or well, it is but, <laughs> south. No, well, yes, it is. It is closer to the South Pole. But saying north and south, um, looking at this map, is kind of misleading because south is in the center. <laughs> <laughs> but it is certainly closer yes. to to the South Pole. It is. Um, it is at the edge of the uh, Ross Ice Shelf um, in the Transantarctic Mountains. The reason here again is that the peaks of the Transantarctic Mountains are lurking out of the ice, so they are ice free. That means we have a chance to to actually um, go out there and look for fossils, while the rest of the continent largely is covered by ice, and that makes it impossible. So, if you had a choice, um, if you had to choose between the Antarctic melting and finding more dinosaurs, or leaving the ice there and not finding more dinosaurs, um, I don't think I have to guess. It's, it's very difficult be. because the implications would mean that we have a huge alteration of the climate. And um, yes. I would rather prefer not to. But Same it's here. interesting. Same the, 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 the thing that that shows is that there's so much more to discover and so much more to explore in Antarctica. And um, with every inch that gets released by ice, we have the chance and possibility to learn more about um, how climate changes have affected the Earth how uh, different setups uh, in in the atmosphere have changed um, li- uh, life on uh, on the planet, and also how the ocean currents might have just uh, been affected by more fresh water in the ocean, and how that still was capable of supporting life, even though it might be just different life than we know today. Okay, so with that, um, amazing content. Thank you so much for pulling all this together. I know this is t- takes a long time to prepare. And, but uh, it's particularly fun when it's about dinosaurs. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> that is it for this week. If you have any interesting news for us, um, hit us up. We're on the social media at Curiously Polar. And of course, on our website, curiouslypolar.com. And uh, as usual, we'll um, try to pull... More interesting topics together for you. We'll be back in probably a week. Until then, everyone, take care and uh, see you then.